Well, it's five minutes past seven, so let's get started. It's a beautiful day here at the Abyss. And in fact, most days here at the Abyss are beautiful. Uh, hmm. I'm going to use the uh, speakeasy text for the beginning of this uh, tour. And uh, as we move along, I'm going to stop using prepared text entirely and uh, just voice and typed text. But I wanted to make sure that everybody got some introduction here. And I do hope that you've had a little bit of an opportunity to look around, um, look around at the posters here, because it'll give you some idea of the vast number of exhibits that are um, here on the Abyss Observatory, <clears throat> um, both on the ground and up in the sky. So the title, today we're going to do something different. In the past, we have started with the tropical area. Um, there is so much going on in the Arctic and the subarctic that today we are going to start there. Um, and we may not even get around to the tropical area, but certainly you can come back and explore that. Um, and there we will do other tours as well. So my second life name is Delia Lake. Um, I know many of you, but not all of you. And some I've known for years and years. In the solid world, I am, my name is Linda Kelly, and I work in consulting about sustainability, um, and particularly in um, enterprise ecology, which covers a systems effect, a systems approach to um, doing responsible business. Here, I have the great privilege of being a habitat curator for the Abyss Observatory and uh, work with Jan in producing what you see here, and many other people as well. This is truly a team effort to make the Abyss Observatory. <clears throat> so welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you here today. And as you see from the, um, the posters, there are many, many exhibits and technologies highlighted here. So please do come back <coughs> as often it, <coughs> excuse me, as often as you can. Somebody mentioned earlier they wanted to go swimming. Yeah, I do too. So, yes, we will. Uh, some of us will certainly do that today. Um, because we want to have this as um, meaningful to you as possible, we will be using 
only the beginning introduction in preparation and then uh, text chat and voice. So please do interrupt with questions at any time. We may or may not get through the temperate and um, tropical areas, but we will do as much as we can today and plan for other tours at another time. So if, if you like swimming and um, you know, feel free to change into a swimming suit later or uh, now or uh, scuba or any, any other such thing. So let's get walking across the bridge and then to your left. We're standing here in front of Noah's Okeanos. Okeanos is an exploration and research ship um, in Second Life. We have the uh, Okeanos always docked here at uh, Port Canaveral in Florida, but in um, the other world, the, the solid world, she is on the second leg of a research um, pro program. And so she will be out until July 12th and um, researching the deep water off North Carolina, way beyond the continental shelf. And this is an area we don't know much about. Um, we have thought that some of the very deep water was basically vacant, and it is not at all. So if you want to follow the research, I gave a, a link to the uh, Okeanos' live stream, and so you might want to copy that down, because they have three cameras of um, live underwater showing what they're doing. <clears throat> when you return here, you might also want to uh, walk on to the research special vessel here and, and take a look around. But for today, we will continue our our tour here.
As we enter a colder area, um, you'll see that the vegetation is going to change to primarily conifers in uh, so far as trees go. But I want to note that here to our um, right up the hill is a stand of red cedar. But one of them looks very stressed. That's because it is. Um, climate change is um, enabling the insects to travel further north, to um, live through winters, and um, this is a really negative effect on the trees. It is stressing them significantly. Now, in front of me is a map projection. Well, actually, a series of map projections. I'm going to move ahead, but take a minute and look at the maps, um, because that will give you an idea of the uh, real world counterparts to what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, it, it's hot here today. I mean, it's hot in the area that we are walking through as an example. Um, it is, and I'll say this a couple of times, it today in the, well, the northern part of the subarctic, today's weather forecast in most of the world is uh, 60 Fahrenheit, you know, 15 Celsius. This is a real, real difficulty for the plants and animals who um, call these areas home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whales are noisy this morning. Yes. Yeah. So the red circle is the area of where we are focusing today. Um, Although there is land mass in the Antarctic, um, the majority of that, the vast majority of that is still covered with ice and people are not, uh, researchers are living there part time, but uh, it is not um, permanently inhabited. If you look around to the uh, left side, you'll see the the uh, world's subarctic regions, and they're marked in pink. And the back, just for reference, and I'll leave this uh, set of maps here, um, is all of the the biomes of the world. So we have um, chosen to focus on three of them here, the subarctic, the temperate, and the, um, the tropical, but there are a number of others as well. So let's, let's walk out a little bit further. Um, I'll go up, but walk out to the rocky point there, and uh, what do you see? Oops, I got stuck in a rock.
Yeah. <clears throat> a stranded polar bear with a cub. Yeah. Um, and it's questionable whether that cub will survive. Now, polar bears can swim, of course. What else do you see here? Yeah, our polar bear here is um, pretty thin. The mother is pretty thin. But for comparison, you know, look at the grizzly on shore and cub. They're going to do okay. There's enough food for them. What about the landscape? What do you see? What kind of landscape is this? Enough salmon, yes. The, in fact, this grizzly mom is eyeing the salmon down below. Um, further south, there, the salmon are very stressed. Right on the point here, what do you see? Right on the rocks.
We have sea lions, we have uh, seals, and um, way around the corner, we have a walrus. Um, the walrus, as you will see, is on shore because there isn't enough ice. Um, they're all being forced inland. Um, and the polar bears also are being forced onto land often these days uh, because they can't fish on the ice flows anymore or in lots of places. In some places they can. So there, because of the heat, um, there is a fundamental breakdown in many of the old normal processes of the Arctic and subarctic. Um, we have very little of the multi-year ice, and that changes the whole circulation system of the Arctic and subarctic regions to only have uh, single-year ice. And it also doesn't support the, the weight or the um, activities of the, the uh, polar bears. And so on both sides, um, where the Arctic and the warmer oceans, although you know, for us we wouldn't consider the North Atlantic or the North Pacific warm, they are they have typically been warmer than um, the Arctic waters. Yes, there's a, this is changing the global circulation. It's changing the global circulation of the ocean water, and it's also changing the um, circulation in the atmosphere. Yes, yes, we have puffins. Yes. Um, the changes are happening a lot faster than people had predicted. So in the Straits, now the Fram is um, in between uh, Greenland and, and Europe. You know, it's war, it's warming a lot faster than um, the Arctic Ocean, even. And the more the ice is melted, the more um, water, heat the water absorbs and the faster it warms. Yeah. That's... Uh, Muran, that's like cutting off your nose to spite your face. And the nature will do what nature is going to do, and that is regardless of what any humans say we should be talking about. Well, you know, yes, Astrid, climate change has always happened. So um, if you go back to the beginnings of planet Earth, we didn't have a, an oxygen atmosphere even. And so over the eons, um, billions of years, we have had warming and cooling and warming and cooling. But what's different here is that it is warming much faster, much, much, much faster. Um, so that the, the last time there were trees in the Arctic, for instance, was um, about three and a half million years ago. Um, it's a long time. Um, 
we're going to get trees in the Arctic in our lifetimes. So that is much faster and none of the plants or animals are able to adjust at the speed that this is happening. You know, as an example, um, not that many years ago, the world scientists decided to build a seed bank at Svartval Island. So that's Norwegian, but it is way above the Arctic Circle. Oh, seemed like a smart thing. Uh, in recorded history, that had always been very solid, uh, very frozen. But that's not true anymore. The ground on uh, Svartval Island is thawing. Um, the permafrost is melting. And although the vault itself is secure, the entrance, the entry ramp has flooded with water. They've had to pump it out. And this is where all the examples of the diverse and unique seeds are stored for the world. So the multi-year ice is disappearing everywhere. And as we said, it has a lot of consequences all around. One of the things that you can't see is the daily vertical migration of the zooplankton. Um, so this has a huge effect on the circulation of the oceans. And you wouldn't think that something, critters that are so microscopic would have that. But they, it is because of the zooplankton rising up in the day and uh, or rising up and falling down that um, you have a lot of the circulation of nutrients here. And all of the creatures depend on that. So that, as a for instance, the gray whales, um, Pacific whales, that they will go for uh, birthing to Baja, California, to the warm waters there. They um, swim in the summer up to the Arctic so that they can feed on the nutrient-rich um, phytoplankton, zooplankton, here in the Arctic. Um, this is having a... Um, Because the, there is an invasion of species of zooplankton and uh, from the warmer waters, this is having an effect on the nutrition of the whales. When would, you don't think about these things. Um, but the copepods that are native to the Arctic are fatter, heavier than the copepods that are uh, native to the warmer waters. And so what happens is that they don't sink as far. The invaders don't sink as far. And there is less circulation and less um, migration of nutrients from the rich bottom waters to the top. We don't know what the real effects will be of this, but as we are humanity in, in the developed countries putting more um, carbon dioxide and uh, methane into the atmosphere and less oxygen into the atmosphere, because of um, cutting down forests, because of the um, reduced circulation in the Arctic, 
this is bound to have a detrimental effect on much of the Earth's life. Yes. Yes, it's both that they, uh, the migration, all right, so the migration patterns have changed in the oceans. Uh, with the warmer waters, the, you know, the prey fish are going farther north, and so the sequence uh, it is out of whack. So the birthing and early feeding of um, many species is out of whack. The typical, traditional prey species are not there in abundance where the, at the, um, the traditional birthing spawning areas. And so that's part of what has the um, whales hungry. That coupled with the less nutrient rich water here so that the phytoplankton um, and zooplankton that are here in the Arctic are uh, smaller. They're thinner, they're smaller, they're not as nutritious. So that eating, you have, the larger animals have to eat a lot more. Um, and we are seeing plastic pollution in all of the waters. So you have the microplastics up here in the Arctic waters as well. Um, no nutrition in that. Yeah, yes, yes, so they are, the animals are getting diseases and stresses that they never had before and so that they Evolution can't change that fast. It can't work that fast. Now, grizzlies and polar bears can intermate. Um, there's only, they thought for a while that there were multiple examples, but it, there's really so far only one example of that happening. Um, and so the research is um, very small, but they expect that that's going to happen a lot more as the um, polar bears must migrate inland. So. Either you, you can walk up onto the land and up the hill a little bit, or you can just cam up. But somebody mentioned uh, the tundra and the melting of the permafrost. Um, that certainly has happened, and it's happening here in our virtual example as well. So um, if you notice up top, no, um, Veron, it, it, the only example they have, it did not produce infertile, you know, we're not getting mules, mule bears or whatever, um, but they, this particular one um, family set was more aggressive, but since it's such a small sample, they don't know that that's the, what is going to happen. They, they, there just is not data at this point. Right. So the, the beavers is another really interesting change. There have always been beavers in the, uh, the southern part of the subarctic, or there have been for um, a very long time. But they have not moved into the northern areas. But as the thawing of the tundra, uh, the thawing of the permafrost, the beavers are moving north and they're making their ponds. So what does that mean? It means that there are now homes to a whole new set of plants and animals. So you're getting 
shrubs that were not there before. You are getting um, habitat for m more moose, for more deer coming up. Um, yeah, the beavers are changing the whole landscape. So we don't typically think of one species being a pivotal change species, but this is one that is already making that change. Take a minute, you know, start to walk off the point and, and let's walk along the, uh, along the coast a little bit more. Well, um, Cass, in that, this area, the human populations are very small. So there are, the beavers are making a significant change and allowing other animals and plants to move in so that they, uh, with more water, they're, you, these are well-fed uh, brown bears. They don't bite. So, but if you look around, you're going to see that there are wolves, um, there are elk, moose, more grasses, uh, more insects. Somebody mentioned insects. Um, insects never survived the Arctic winters before. But some of the recent winters have been so warm that insects are surviving, which is just mind-boggling. If you look down into the the water here, you'll see that there is a cold water coral reef. Until recently, nobody knew that there were any cold water corals, but now we have found them really all over the coastal areas of the world, and we're doing more and more deep water research and finding corals there too. So although the tropical corals are highly stressed and may not survive, there are cold water corals as well. Um, another thing here that will probably affect what we have done in this particular display this particular habitat is that they are finding uh, more with the um, the robot research and they're getting more pictures of uh, the deep water squid and so they had recently a a juvenile trying to um, pull off parts of a camera um, but it was only the I think the third ghost squib, squid that they had ever been able to photograph doing things. As we said, all of the animals and plants are going to find their, um, their nutrient sources changing. Some will be able to adapt and some will not. So there's no way that in any virtual setting we can 
represent the entire habitat of with all of the ecology. But we've tried to do uh, representative samples here so that in every habitat you will find um, a representative set of plants and animals. You will find both prey and predators. Um, and while they might not all live in exactly the same place, they all live in these kinds of environments. So from here, for people who want to go underwater and swim, yeah, absolutely, that's a great thing to do. But for people who would prefer to walk, if you go up here in a minute, you can, <coughs> you can take the, the tube. I'm <coughs> Excuse me, I'm going to swim, but um, other people are, are welcome to go down with tube. Oh, and before you go, you might notice that there is a, a brown bear, a uh, grizzly, right above here, moving into a, um, a temperate coastal rainforest. <coughs> and again, if you explore that, excuse me, for you will find an entire habitat right there in that little coastal rainforest. I'm going to quickly change into scuba. And uh, and get my water. So this is a transition zone. It's a transition between the subarctic and the um, the temperate. What you will see here is that the um, kelp forests are moving north as well. So either swim or cam here. Um, kelp forests are one of the high, most highly productive areas of the, the ocean. And uh, they are not only spawning grounds, but home to many, many creatures, big and small. Yeah, the water's a little bit cooler here. Yeah. Uh, you might want to cam down. We did not go down there, but do cam down all the way to the bottom here because at the um, in the deep ocean. <clears throat> Mostly temperate, but some tropical, although they don't really know because they have not, they're finding more and more and more and more of the hydrothermal vents, the, the hot water ocean vents. 
um, you will see why it's important to have the phytoplankton do move the, the water columns because as things die and de decay, decompose, you know, the nutrients stay on the bottom. And this movement of the circulation by the, the phytoplankton brings the, this nutrient source up to the top again. But you will find uh, some of the tube worms, some of the, um, the clams, and some animals down there. There are uh, coelacanths. There are a number of fish and crabs and that cannot go to the surface, that they are so adapted to the very high pressure of the, the lower waters. Also, um, there's no sunlight, so photosynthesis doesn't operate. And they, uh, <clears throat> they are able to use the hydrogen sulfide, which would uh, burn most creatures to do what sunlight would normally do for um, surface animals, or surface plants, rather. So moving along here a little bit, what do you find if you go down here? What do you what do you find here in the kelp forest? What do you notice? Yes, yes, the thermal the hydrogen sulfide from the thermal vents, uh, the and the heat is providing an energy. Um, allows them to convert uh, energy, yes. <clears throat> Notice that it's not just one kind of um, algae. And kelp, by the way, is a giant algae. It is not a plant like a, uh, like a land plant. No, there are no roots to kelp. Uh, and in fact, they float. Now, because, <coughs> excuse me, um, there is a sign up there, and it has some information about kelp forests around the world. Well, the sign is in the tube. But with the warmer waters, kelp forests are also under attack. Uh, and they have enemies that they never had before. So it's not just the, the water itself um, being warmer. It's that they are being eaten, used in faster than they can move or, or adapt. No, I don't see it here, but usually there is a uh, a shark that comes around here. I don't know what happened to it, where it is today. But often when I'm down here, I get uh, nudged by by a great white shark. Um, yeah, yeah, so far I have not gotten bitten, but, but I had, have gotten pushed, yeah. Yeah, um, George, there, I don't know. There are positives and negatives, I think, about the the kelp farming. Um, 
it may may work it may not they're trying that off um, some of the southern Alaskan coasts um, because the fishing has changed significantly and they can't make a living um, with fishing the same way that they used to um, so we'll see we'll see I think it needs to be closely monitored yeah yeah but the thing is with the regulation we don't really know yet and so the reason I say close closely monitored is we have to um, keep checking it and reporting and checking it and reporting so that we know what changes there are because we simply do not know right now yeah yeah If we move along a little bit further, we come to another nursery area. Um, and this is the marine grasses and the, the um, different kind of algae and the, the eelgrass and marine grasses. So most of the shellfish, many of the smaller fish spawn in this kind of an area. Uh, usually people don't like this grass. And so when um, people build houses and resort areas along the coast, along any of the coasts, they dredge this, they remove it. The fishing by dredging, the bottom trawling also removes this grass. And what this does is it takes away the habitats for uh, clams, oysters, uh, many of the smaller fish, lobsters, for, for where they spawn. And so that again makes a, uh, decreases the population. Um, and that's in addition to the overfishing that happens. And we are severely overfishing the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> that's if you, yeah, yeah, if you are talking about real estate as um, an investment for human second homes yeah then the wetlands are can be they could say it's wasted but all of the wetlands are the um the filters for the water so that they are both uh, filtering the water to clean it but they are also most of the areas are also um, storm mitigators. So, yeah, they're stabilizing in very real and important ways. And you do read about that as the, um, um, the mangrove forests along the tropical coasts. But if you take a minute and you look up here, um, just above and to the, the left, of where we are right now. You'll see a, a little point, and this is a unique and, um, again, endangered representation of a coastal temperate forest. So earlier we saw the, the temperate rainforest that is, if you want to know more about that, look up um, the Great Bear Forest rainforest that goes hundreds of miles up and down the Canadian Pacific coast. But this is 
more of an Atlantic coast area. And you'll see that this is a oak and uh, pine and uh, cranberry. It's a bog area. And again, it stabilizes the, the land. And in most places, oak or pine are not, they don't do well in salt water, but these have adapted over ages and ages to need the salt water and hence the, um, the spray that comes up. They are absolutely coastal forest areas. And if you come back, there's a, a nice little um, cushion to sit under one of the trees there and just kind of look out at the, the water. Um, before we go any further, and we have talked about plastic and the, the plastic pollution, but we can do a little better than that. If you go back toward the, if you, um, put your camera vision back toward the, the northern, toward the Arctic a little bit. You'll see a small area that has uh, sea otters. It has a log that Jan put out with turtles. Uh, there's a seal right now climbing up the, the coast, which they do. Um, and you'll see an area that is covered with with, yeah, Four Ocean has done some of this work, yes. You'll see um, seaweed covering a rocky area. Um, you'll see dead trees. You'll see driftwood. So somebody mentioned the rise in the, um, the sea, the height of the sea. Yeah, there are places that have, were forested and are now, um, inundated and so the trees have died this is one of those places there where the the sea level has risen but more than that um, we're taking this area as a demonstration area to show what happens because normally you don't see the plastic where we are in most of the developed world the plastic that is in the ocean that is large chunks is either in the um, the garbage gyres in the mid oceans or along the coasts of the the less developed areas. Um, but it's there and it's real and um, it's all ours, so that we have done this. We really have made a, um, yeah, it's conveniently not in our view. We don't see the, the mess that we have wrought. Although if you look up a little bit, just where that seal was going up, just above the, the right hand part of the driftwood, you will see a carcass of a dead bird that was full of plastic. And if you look a little closer, there is no away. There is no away anymore. If you look a little closer, you're going to see the plastic. And it's not just the plastic bottles and cans and shoes and it's also the the fishing gear, the the nets, the wires, and all of that is catching and harming 
the sea creatures. So that you have turtles, you have seals, you have whales, you have dolphins and porpoises, um, along with many other marine animals that get caught and strangled by this. This is our mess. We have made this mess and somehow we have to clean it up. So I'm going to leave that out there, you know, as a reminder for people. Yeah. That this is real and it's everywhere. In fact, recent research has shown that even in the Antarctic, in the waters, there are microplastics. We cannot get away from it anymore. Um, it's up to us to insist that we do better not only at recycling, but it has to start with the design process. To start with a redesign so that we don't have this kind of waste and so that it does not get discarded anywhere because the plastics will be here for thousands of years. Some of them. Some of them will break down in hundreds of years, but some of them will be there for thousands. Yeah. Yeah, we've already we we've messed up the the sky too. And the the CO2 will be around for thousands of years. So even if we stopped what we're doing today, we would still have an increase in uh, warming of the atmosphere and the oceans for a significant period of time. So every time from now on, if you are swimming and you feel the, the grasses tickle your toes or your legs, remember that this is not something to um, pull out and throw away, but this is the, the nursery area for some very important animals. Uh, look at that, we have a, uh, a horseshoe crab flying, swimming above us. Well, it looks like we are going to get over to the tropical area after all. You notice all along that we have had whales accompanying us. Whales swim the entire range of the oceans. They swim thousands of miles. So that you will find some kinds of whales in, in all of the oceans. Now notice how different the, um, the corals look here. Whoops. What do you think makes the difference here?
Yeah, more light definitely is a change. But the colors of the corals come from microalgae. So we don't typically think of the role of algae in all of our ocean um, processes. But these algae don't live in the colder waters so that the very cold water corals don't, don't have the bright colors. There are so many kinds of algae. <laughs> it's eep, is that somebody's getting uh, stalked by a mora eel? But they do that here. The eels are, uh, again, well fed, no danger, but, um, but they will stalk you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the corals here are again under attack, though. They are under attack from the, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sure, sure, we can give the, the eel a name, yeah. But they, they are under attack from the temperatures and from the uh, composition, the chemical composition of the waters so that when the oceans absorb the carbon dioxide and of all of the carbon dioxide that we humans have spewed out from our um, manufacturing and from our lifestyles, you know, we hear about what goes into the atmosphere, but the vast majority has been absorbed by the oceans. So what that does is uh, turn the oceans more acidic. And why is that of uh, worry? Well, it, we read a little bit about the bleaching of the corals, but it also is uh, softening the, the uh, shells of all of the crustaceans, of all of the mollusks are much more brittle. So that it will take centuries for um, for the ocean to be more neutral and less acidic. So all in all, this is beautiful as it is. It is another area that is under you know, severe stress. So the question, one of the questions is, you know, what will be able to adapt and what will not? You, know, you read about the, the likely extinctions. Um, some will migrate, some uh, adapt, some other species will move in, um, and we just don't know. All we can say is that it is most likely that things will be very different for our grandchildren than they have been for us. There's much more here than I have gone over. Uh, really, I do invite you to come back and uh, explore on your own. Yeah, I hope. The, the reason I do habitats like this, the reason I 
want to build habitats like this is that we can read all we want about the science and about what's happening. But being here, having an experience, even if it is a virtual experience, gives a different sense than you can get from just reading the text. So swimming with the whales, um, being nudged by a moray eel, um, riding a shark, riding a, uh, swimming along with an orca, um, makes, gives a different sense of what is going on under the sea than, uh, than you get any other way. And for many of us, we will never go diving in the Arctic. We may never go diving in the tropics, but here we can. So please um, come back, bring your friends. Um, we can do more tours. There are lots of things we did not cover. Um, we can have all sorts of conversations. We. Jan and I would love to have people come back and we would love to interact. We would love to talk about what are some of the, the really important things that are going on in science and in human activity. So thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Bergen. You know, we haven't done that, and maybe we should. Maybe we should uh, put this on the um, destination guide. Thank you for mentioning that. But you're very welcome. You can tell that I love doing this. <laughs> And uh, Jan loves doing this too. We don't have bleached corals here in the um, in the tropical, but we could we actually could put some around the the corner a little bit, and and that may be a a a very good suggestion uh, to show what that would look like, yeah. So next time, next time we'll have a little bit of an area of bleached corals. So do feel free to continue swimming around or you know, I'll hang out for a little bit. Um, if you have any other questions or things you want to uh, mention or talk about, you know.
Yeah, and do share the the video on the website. I mean, we have had here, uh, as an example, we have had um, students from an English-speaking school in Germany come through. Um, and um, throughout the years with the marine habitats, um, we, I have had um, different schools from around the world either come to visit or to watch the videos of some of, of these areas. But as I said before, if you can actually get here, you know, bring your friends to, to actually come and swim and walk around. Well, George, you just have to come back. Yeah, and it, it was all videoed, so that will get posted. But if you if you come off around by yourself and you have questions, you know, please do reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Many of the places have note cards around, uh, signs with note cards. So if I'm not around or um, Jan isn't around, uh, do, do check out the, the information that we have put out already. <laughs> 